Hi, I'm Walter DeYoung, the potato breeder at Cornell. I've been here for about 21 years. This is my 21st or 22nd crop season. I'm currently standing in the middle of what we call our raised beds, where we plant our first generation seedlings, about 20,000 or so each year. Um, we end up harvesting four tubers from each pot, and those go into the field next year for uh, additional generations of selection. My breeding program has two main foci. Um, the first is to develop varieties that are resistant to the golden cyst nematode, and the second is to develop potatoes that have a quality that people want to grow them. Um, for us, it's largely a focus on chipping potatoes. Golden nematode is a serious quarantine pest that's present in New York and no other state. Um, and for about 40 years, the strategy in New York for controlling golden nematode has been to require growers to grow resistant varieties as part of an approved crop rotation. Of course, if we're going to mandate that growers grow resistant varieties, someone has to develop them. Uh, my predecessors started that, and I've been continuing it since I've been here. So, um, we've been quite successful in terms of controlling golden nematode with resistant varieties. There hasn't been any meaningful spread in New York um, for the past 30 or 40 years. Cis nematodes are kind of an, an attractive pest to control by resistance. Uh, this isn't something you could do with a lot of other pathogens because resistance is, even if it evolves in a field, doesn't spread um, very quickly. That said, uh, some of our varieties have become so popular that growers want to grow them year after year after year on infested land, and a new race of golden nematode has arisen. And uh, for the past 25 years or so, we've also been breeding for resistance to a new strain. Just a couple of years ago, we released our first varieties resistant to that, that new race, um, varieties Brody and Upstate Abundance. When it comes to quality, the primary traits we focus on in our program are breeding um, new varieties of chipping potatoes. Potato chips were invented in New York, um, so for nothing else, for historical reasons, our program has long focused on developing new varieties for potato chips. Key attributes in a chipping variety are a round tuber shape, relatively high starch content so the potatoes don't absorb much oil, and um, low accumulation of sh sugars, particularly glucose and fructose, during cold storage because that leads to a Maillard reaction and browning when the potatoes are fried. We've been quite successful in developing um, good chipping varieties. The most widely grown chipping variety in the country today is Lamoka, a variety we released uh, 10 years ago. Uh, that and a couple other varieties we've released collectively represent about a quarter of the chipping potatoes um, that are grown in the U.S. today. The biggest challenge in potato breeding, in my view, um, is the extensive segregation that happens after we make any cross. Potato is incredibly heterozygous. It has a snip every 15 to 20 nucleotides. Um, potatoes also ought to tetraploid. So as a result, every time we make a cross, literally thousands of loci are segregating. The potato seedlings behind me may look cute and innocent, but what they really reflect is an incredible amount of genetic chaos. Um, at, at the moment, going forward, the potato breeding and genetics community has a lot of different options and it isn't clear which one is going to be best suited to dealing with the huge amount of variation that we have. Um, for the time being, I think all of us have to continue breeding at the tetraploid level. I'll be starting to use genomic selection soon to make it more efficient for how we select for processing traits in our program. And if for no other reason that I got to keep developing golden nematode resistant varieties that New York growers need. There's a, several large companies as well as a large public sector effort in the U.S. to reinvent potato as a diploid crop, a diploid inbreeding tolerant crop. Um, that will clearly simplify how much segregation we deal with whenever we make make a cross. It isn't clear to me how long it's going to take until we can reduce the pretty sizable genetic load the potato has so that diploid potatoes can yield as well as tetraploids. At the moment, the best diploid potatoes yield about 70% of the best tetraploids. My best guess would be a, a decade or more. Um, on a global scale, it's clearly the most Reinventing potatoes as diploid is the most important experiment that's going on in, in potato breeding and genetics around the world. But it's, it's, it's a long-term experiment. I'm contributing to the U.S. effort by extracting diploids from some of our better tetraploids as we create a, a, a nationally diverse broad set of, of diploid germplasm that can be a foundation for the nation's diploid breeding 
um, going forward. Um, and the last area which I personally think in the long term is going to have the biggest impact on potatoes is skipping um, meiosis and, and, and recombination entirely and just using gene editing techniques to, to alter potatoes that we currently have to make them better in specific and designed and desirable ways. So gene editing isn't yet at a level, as we all know, that's particularly um, can be particularly targeted to change any given nucleotide to any other given nucleotide. As a former virologist who was doing this 30 years ago, it's something I've always wanted to do in potato, and I expect when that becomes routine in potato, the, the preferred way to improve, um, to, to do most of the improvement we do in potato is to take potatoes that have a lot of attributes that we already want uh, and add individual genes, or not add, change existing alleles, undesirable ones, to desirable ones to get the end product um, that we want. And tor towards that end, um, in terms of basic research, my lab um, uh, already over a decade ago uh, isolated various um, genes in potato that are um, control potato color traits, yellow or tuber flesh or purple or red tuber flesh, purple or red skin color. Um, I guess the big picture is in potato at the moment, even if we could genetically uh, edit any allele we wanted to, to, to any other desirable allele we wanted, we don't know enough about the genotype phenotype map in potato to have a lot of targets to edit today. I think an awful lot of work is still needed to make those connections, identifying genes that control specific traits. That's largely what my own lab program uh, is aimed at. Um, I've recently shifted away from working on color genes to trying to isolate a bunch of disease resistance genes that I care about, nematode resistance genes, uh, unsurprisingly given the importance in New York to, to keep the golden nematode under control, and also um, resistance genes to potato virus Y, which has become uh, an increasingly important problem in the country. Potato virus Y has for a long time just been something that reduces yield a little bit, but there are now necrotic strains that in some varieties make the tubers unmarketable. That's a lot more of a serious issue. There are genes that we have deployed in varieties of um, haven't broken down for decades, but um, identifying those genes so that we can um, edit potatoes to make them PVY resistant or add it through agrobacterium or other um, engineering means would, would further simplify how we develop varieties going forward. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.